The president this morning um, has talked about uh, some of our jurisprudence and the prosecutor has talked about uh, some of our capacity building initiatives and uh, you know I had intended to speak exclusively about those two areas in terms of the legacy. The president asked uh, why tribunals and if they were created because of a vacuum cr created by conflict my question would be why legacy and um, I'd suggest that it's because of the limited mandate uh, of these tribunals as opposed to national courts um, which are there as part of the state uh, that we must interrogate and find out whether these tribunals leave anything behind for posterity uh, whether they have um, left a legacy for national jurisdictions, international jurisdictions in terms of prosecuting international crime. But before doing so, um, <coughs> I'd just like to make some brief remarks uh, on, on, on comments made by Phil Clark this morning and, uh, and Etienne, um, which will probably contextualize the discussion. Um, Phil identified problems, and I'd suggest that they're not exclusive to the ICTR, but arise from the architecture of international criminal justice institutions, particularly the ad hocs, uh, set up to deal with the fallout from conflict you know, in societies that had been totally devastated and couldn't, didn't have the capacity or, you know, or the will to dispense justice. Uh, the ad hocs were limited uh, by their mandates to being retributive on the understanding that criminal prosecution of a uh, perpetrators would somehow contribute to peace and reconciliation. Indeed, if you have a closer look at uh, the text of Resolution 955 of November 1994, setting up the tribunal, uh, you, you'll find out that the ICTR was set up exclusively for the sole purpose of prosecuting those responsible for the genocide and other crimes. Reconciliation is only referred to in the preamble uh, with the Security Council convinced that you know, prosecuting uh, those responsible for the genocide would somehow contribute to, 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 to reconciliation and lasting peace. Uh, the tribunals, however, uh, you know, because of this architecture of international criminal justice, you know, cannot or could not be expected to prosecute everyone. In a hundred, a hundred days, a uh, million people killed, that works out about 10,000 people a day. Now that takes a lot of perpetrators to commit such crimes. Um, but because of their limited mandate and resources, uh, you know, the tribunals had to be selective uh, in determining who to pursue. Um, and as the prosecutor explained uh, in, in his comments uh, to Phil's presentation, focused on those most responsible, but of course there are other considerations, objective criteria that are public. Um, again, a closer look at Resolution 955, setting up the tribunal, um, you can discern that the tribunal wasn't expected to prosecute everyone. Th this is a shared responsibility between the tribunal, Rwanda, and other member states of the United Nations, uh, which were expected uh, to assist Rwanda in bringing to justice um, uh, the mass of perpetrators. Finally, I'd like to suggest that uh, you know, in this transitional justice enterprise, um, uh, it's it, it's a partnership. It's a partnership between the tribunal and other national institutions. The tribunal wasn't meant to be a fix-all and. Uh, you know, single-handedly contribute to, to, to reconciliation. No. Um, there are other mechanisms nationally. Uh, there are prosecutions before the national courts, prosecutions before the Gachacha courts, uh, which my friend Phil has written extensively about, uh, the Human Rights Commission, Genocide Commission. Uh, because we're not just dealing with um, a genocide that occurred in the span of 100 days, no. We're dealing with deep-rooted you know, conflict going back 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, discrimination, deprivation um, of, of, of minorities. Uh, and the tribunal um, clearly wouldn't have been expected 
um, to fix uh, the mess, as it were, single-handedly. So uh, when we talk about reconciliation, um, it was supposed to be a spin-off from criminal prosecutions. And uh, criminal prosecutions and other transitional justice mechanisms nationally designed to redress um, decades of, um, of gross violation. Right, um, as I said earlier, I'm supposed to talk about um, jurisprudence and legacy products, uh, the capacity building, best practices, both of which have been touched upon um, by the president and the prosecutor. Um, regarding jurisprudence, um, <coughs> one cannot talk about genocide uh, without referring to the Locus Classicus, the Akaiesu case, um, which now is known more for its advances in um, sexual violence and rape uh, than actually interpreting and extending the scope um, of, of the Genocide Convention and indeed the Statute of the Tribunal Article 2 on Genocide uh, when it comes to protected group. Um, the chamber in Akaios who thought outside the box and extended um, the protections afforded by the Genocide Conventions uh, beyond the four groups uh, in the Statute of the Tribunal and the Convention um, and decided that it included any stable and permanent group not otherwise you know, fitting in the narrow constructions of the Convention and the Statute. Um, they'd hit a brick wall because um, the, the, the Tutsi didn't quite fit into, uh, into the narrow constructions of, um, of the Convention and the Statute. And uh, it's, it's, it's the, the, the decision has um, created opportunities um, for prosecutions um, or, or for protections of people that fall outside these groups. And uh, indeed, um, the controversy created by the Akayesu uh, judgment regarding protected groups um, reared its head in the al-Bashir warrant case, uh, where both the Commission of Inquiry and the trial chamber weren't satisfied that uh, uh, genocide had been committed uh, until the chamber, the appeals chamber intervened uh, uh, and remitted the matter to, to, to the trial chamber. So, in a sense, there has been a positive application of the Akayesu uh, judgment and definitions to extend protections uh, to the victims in Darfur. Of course, the jury is still out, um, but we're hopeful uh, whenever it goes to trial that um, Akayesu would be upheld. Uh, I'll not go into rape and uh, sexual violence. Uh, um, one of my colleagues, Teresa, maybe tomorrow will be going into greater detail. Um, the president also mentioned Kambanda, uh, and I'd only like to add a footnote that, you know, even though Kambanda never contested the charges, more said to the immunity, the the decision nonetheless reaffirmed the principle embodied in the statutes of both the ICTR and ICTY that no individual enjoys impunity for such crimes on account of their official position. And indeed, um, so soon after his judgment, and I think it was 1999, the Kambanda decision uh, was cited in the House of Lords um, for the proposition that uh, Pinochet uh, couldn't assert immunity. And um, yeah, since then we've had Slobodan Milosevic, former president of Yugoslavia, had the prosecution of Charles Taylor, former president of um, Liberia, uh, the prosecution of Hussein Habre, former president of Chad in, in Senegal, uh, and the current cases, um, uh, of course, in the ICC against Uru Kenyatta and, 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 um, and 
al Bashir. War crimes. Um, ICTR had difficulty there, and in fact, um, again, uh, we go back to a Kayesu, which applied the government agent test, because war crimes um, s sort of connote, you know, this military hierarchical um, involvement, armed conflict. Um, so the trial chamber in Akayeso actually got it wrong um, and applied the, the, the public agent, you know, government official test, which Rutaganda did away with. Rutaganda wasn't um, a government agent. He was uh, vice president of the local militia, the Intera um, who, who too had been acquitted on, 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 on trial at first instance, but convicted on appeal for war crimes. Um, so the advances made based on the Kunarats were the conviction uh, of Rutaganda for war crimes, uh, but more importantly, a clarification of the required nexus, because the nexus uh, um, had never been elaborated, uh, particularly in the context of um, a civilian. It wasn't really a big issue in Kunarats in the ICTY because you know he was a member of the military. Um, but it was a big issue considering, of course, Akayesu having um, applied the wrong test. Uh, so, yes, um, the uh, ICTR resolved that, the Appeals Chamber resolved that, and, and has created opportunities, uh, extended protections um, for rendering culpable civilians. Um, in indulging in, in culpable acts uh, under the guise of an armed conflict. We've heard mention of the media case, a groundbreaking judgment that confronted the limits of free speech and um, clarified uh, mass hate speech is genocidal. Uh, uh, as, as the president mentioned this morning, the first conviction for direct and public incitement um, it demonstrated how, without a firearm, machete, or any physical weapon, uh, the accused caused the death of thousands of innocent um, civilians. I turn to superior responsibility, um, again, which I believe the registrar, Mr. Majola, will be addressing in greater detail, but would only want to underscore the decisions in Kaishema, Musema, Nahimana, um, which demonstrate um, or e extended the doctrine of superior responsibility uh, to include um, culpability for civilian um, s superiors. It's not exclusively um, command responsibility under the Geneva Conventions, um, but extends um, both for genocide crimes against humanity and Article Common 3 to civilian perpetrators. Um, Kaishema was a district administrator, prefer of Kibuye. Uh, Musema was a factory director. Nahimana uh, was a director of the hate radio station. Um, in, in a related sense, the ICT also broadened the scope of uh, prosecuting individuals, civilians, for ordering um, crimes, um, even if they didn't hold public office. Uh, and we have the example of Laura Semanza, a former Borg master, um, and Kajel Jelly, a former Borg master, being found uh, guilty of individual criminal responsibility under Article 6.1 for ordering the commission of crimes, despite the fact that they held no um, official positions. Um, I've been told to wrap up. The prosecutor has um, outlined the other legacy products of the ICTR, lessons learned and best practices. Um, I, I'll just wrap up um, by suggesting that uh, the, the 
ICTR has made significant contribution to the evolving international criminal justice regime um, in four key respects. First, by clearly defining genocide, its scope as a crime has extended has been extended to cover intended destruction of a particular stable and permanent group and acknowledge that rape and sexual violence could constitute genocide. Second, by shattering the myth of sovereign impunity, uh, the ICTR has lent added impetus to the assertion of universal jurisdiction by states seeking to prosecute former leaders for atrocities committed while in office. Third, by recognizing the role of the print and electronic media in inciting genocide, the ICTR sounded a warning to the abuse of freedom of expression and the incitement of international crimes. Fourth, by clarifying on the applicability of the doctrine of superior responsibility and the Geneva Conventions to civilian perpetrators in armed conflict, such civilians can no longer evade the long arm of the law. And finally, um, the ICTR, together with the ICTI, uh, I, I suggest provided the building blocks upon which the ICC was founded and, and, and leave a large corpus of um, substantive and procedural law uh, as, as its legacy to, to both the national courts and other international courts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.